Jenny taught me how to do the recording to the cloud. We nice. recorded last night and Leo was in the bathtub and she had to get out and go potty. <laughs> so we had to <laughs> stop recording her. Get <laughs> right over. Move it over. <laughs> and then we ended up recording. I didn't hit the right button and we ended up doing a book and recording that. And we were singing, he's got the whole world in his hand. <laughs> so, uh, she now has a recording of that. <laughs> Aww. So, um, if you want to open your books to the foreword, that's this page, the very beginning. And do you see this little symbol right here? Yes. I was looking to see who was coughing, but it, obviously yeah. it's Jim. He wanted you to know he was here. <laughs> oh, Jim. <laughs> so um, this is the symbol for God. And um, the book, the entire See Through the Scriptures, was recorded, was illustrated by a woman who is from Australia. So a lot of the perspective, which we're going to talk about in a minute, is from an Australian perspective. So you'll see when there's a globe, it's kind of from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And so um, this is the symbol that they came up with for God. And the circle in the center is because God is eternal. And the arrows going out is because God's love for us only goes out. And what they liken it to is a faucet. So if there's a faucet and you turn the faucet on, the water doesn't go into the faucet, it comes out of the faucet. Well, that's what God is like. God is loving us all the time. And that's, that's God's perspective is that God loves us. And so the arrows are going out. And that's a symbol that you'll see in a lot of the different illustrations. Um, and because this is an international Bible study, they've used it all over the world. And so the, the symbols are easy to understand in any country, in any language. Um, he says on here that it was produced to provide hands-on training. It's, a de it's designed to serve as a tool to convince people that we need to read the Bible, that we can understand the Bible's message, and that we can explain that message to other people. And that's kind of hard to, to agree with sometimes. <laughs> if we're to make sense out of the Bible, however, the three things that we will discover are important. We need to know the biblical storyline, or what they call the narrative. And we need to know the themes that weave their way through that storyline, which is the narrative theology. And then third, we need to see what Jesus does with the biblical storyline and its themes which is the systemization of Jesus' teachings. We won't see the teachings until we get to the New Testament, which is where Jesus is here with us on earth. And what he talks about here is when Jesus explained to the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, so the Emmaus walk or the walk to Emmaus. On Easter Sunday, when he rose, he joined two of his disciples and walked to the city of Emmaus with them, and they didn't see that he was Jesus. They just thought he was some stranger. And he talked about himself, and he talked about how Jesus how Jesus was with us, and he explained it on the basis of Moses and all the prophets. So that's Old Testament explanation. 
So he went from Genesis through the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then he talked about Joshua and Judges. And then he talked about first and second Samuel and first and second Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then Hosea and the prophet. So those are the books that are history that we call the history books in the Bible. So this see through the scriptures is going to use a similar method to explain Jesus ministry and God's divine plan, what God planned in the very beginning. And then we kind of screwed it up when we disobeyed in the garden. So then throughout all of history, the narrative has been working its way toward Jesus coming and taking things back to what God intended in the first place, which was that God loves us all the time and forgives us. And all we have to do is have faith. What Harry says is, we pray that see through the scriptures will whet many people's appetites to become biblical bloodhounds. People who will saturate themselves in the scriptures and ask constantly, what does this mean? And what is it saying to me and to God's people? What does this mean? Does that smack of Lutheranism or what? <laughs> <laughs> I think I said that uh, times in catechism class. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Luther said it about 50 times in catechism. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to turn the page to the first unit. So I'm on this page. Mm -hmm. And it asks, what do you, where do you live? What do you say when you're asked, where do you live? And we usually think of our house, mm -hmm. our street, the number of our house, the name of our city or town, the state and country in which they're located. Those are the things we think about when we ask where, we, where do we live. And those of you who have traveled, it becomes more important that you designate the country or the state if you're traveling. My brother lives in Florida and he always wears something with the with a University of Michigan logo usually, but something with Michigan on it. And he graduated from there before I graduated from Michigan State. So. <laughs> I have to forgive him, <laughs> but um, he, he's, that's for him because he lives alone, has always been an identifier and a conversation starter. Even at the gas station, people will say, hey, we're visiting from Michigan, and they get into a conversation. So where does he live? He lives in Florida, but he really is an American <laughs> and Michigan person. <laughs> So um, the illustration here is based on um, images from NASA. And it helps us to broaden our thinking. It's um, the majestic spiral galaxy NGC 4414, about 60 million light years from planet Earth. A light year is the distance light travels in a year, approximately six trillion miles. I'm not going to go into the kilometers unless one of you is more familiar with the kilometers. <laughs> um, the universe contains tens of billions of such galaxies each containing hundreds of billions of stars and making the universe so big, its vastness is impossible to comprehend. If the Milky Way galaxy, which is our solar system, could be seen from a distance, it would look like the galaxy depicted the giant pinwheel. A 
about 100,000 light years in diameter. It spins around its axis once every 200 million years. The Milky Way galaxy contains about 100 billion stars, and to count them at a rate of one per second would take about 3,000 years. So we can go to the lower illustration, this one. And this is what he's talking about, if you can see the tiny little pinhead down here. That's how small mercury is. And if you took a grain of mustard seed and you laid it on the ground, 164 feet or 30 yards on a football field, if that's helpful. <laughs> um, no, 50 yards on a football field then you laid Venus down, it would be the size of a pea. Mm -hmm. Then if you go another 80 yards away and laid Earth down, again, the size of a pea, and you would go 430 feet away, or about 150 yards, with the moon as a grain of mustard seed 13 feet out from the Earth. Mars is a raisin 200 yards out, away from Earth. And Jupiter is an orange, Saturn's a tangerine, four-fifths of a mile away from Jupiter. And Jupiter, the orange, is a half mile away from Mars. Uranus is a plum just over a mile away from Saturn. And Neptune is a plum over two miles away from Uranus. And Pluto is a pinhead about three miles away from Neptune. And the sun is the size of a beach ball, 24 inches in diameter. So the planets could be represented as follows. And that's what I just said. Our solar system is very small when compared with other stars and planets. And if the sun was placed at the center of Betelgeuse, a bright red star in the constellation Orion, both Earth and Mars would move around the sun as they do at present distance and remain within Betelgeuse, which is 431 million miles. And about here, I get lost. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> We've gone into another constellation and another galaxy now. The brightest star in our southern sky is 522 million miles away in diameter. 522 million miles in diameter. That's the brightest star in the southern sky. So the sun How far, far, far across is the sun? Does he say that? Well, the sun, the sun's that over on the left, right? Yeah, the, the sun is this big. That fiery. Thing. So it must be millions of miles across too. Absolutely. So, he talks about, um, well, let's stop here and, and have a prayer. Let's do this prayer. If you'll bow your heads. 
This is a prayer that was said by Charles Elliott, Dr. Charles Elliott, the president of Harvard University, and he wrote, if you say there is no God, I can only ask how you, a speck of mortal living for a moment of time on an atom of an earth in plain sight of an infinite universe full of incredible beauty, wonder, and design can so confidently hold so improbable a view. And the prayer is from Psalm Psalm 8. Lord, the heavens and the earth are the work of your fingers. You establish the moon and the stars. Help us to understand how big your universe is, so that we might praise you in a worthy manner. Grant us joy in knowing that you, who made such a vast universe, know all about us little humans, and love and care for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So that's in your workbook. And since probably you didn't read through the stuff in the workbook, I'll um, broach a question out of here. It says, although today's space shuttles have a top speed of about 25,000 miles an hour, and I don't know how up to date this is, because this was printed text and illustrations 2003. <clears throat> oh. This is the third edition. Oh. So, um, I mean, it's still amazing whether it's up to date or, <laughs> or not. <laughs> it's amazing that we can send a probe to Mars. So, <clears throat> if the space shuttle travels a speed of 25,000 miles per hour to get anywhere in the universe, we would have to travel at the speed of light, 186,273 miles per second. However, even if we could travel at the speed of light, it would take us 33,000 years to travel to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. TV programs such as Star Trek, and now Star Wars, show humans traveling at will around the universe. According to information in the paragraph above, the notes on page five of See Through the Scriptures, the manual, why is space travel not as simple as these programs suggest? That's the page we just Well, none oh of us God. has 33,000 years. <laughs> 33,000 years, right? <laughs> True. We need and, one of those non-aging potions or something. So yeah. when you got there, you'd be the same age. Well, and they I travel at the have. speed of light. Are yeah. they, when they hyper space? They, in Star Trek, all they had to do was get in that funny thing. And you know, beam up. And beam up. <laughs> I think the funniest thing I ever heard was, um, very funny, Scotty, now beam up my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we can't do that. We don't have the lifespan. I don't think God intends for us to do that, <laughs> necessarily. <laughs> Maybe someday. 
Um, if you had been on board of the spacecraft that landed on the moon in 1969, if any of you were born back then, <laughs> what insights might you have gained from your travel? I would have gained a totally new perspective of the Earth. I mean, we kind of gain that when we see the pictures, but it's got to be, wow, in real life. And some of the things that we see in the pictures, like this galaxy thing, um, this guy. I wonder if you can see those, probably not much better from the moon. I wouldn't think so. Well, Anything else you can think of? The, probably your perspective, if you were like on the moon, you would see the earth as more as like just one object, mm -hmm. not like separate countries you'd probably just think there's the earth and there's the land and the water right you know, that's the picture is from the moon from the moon landings and stuff always the earth always appears just just the ball with the different colors but um it always amazes me that it's so compact that it's that it's actually a ball <laughs> you know, like, yeah I never, you don't see it that way at all except no. from a, well even from a plane you only see the curve of it you mean it's really not flat it's <laughs> not flat susan <laughs> i i've never fallen off my son works with someone who's a flat earther really yeah oh my goodness and he's had a lot of discussions with him I, I think he's, I think that he's pretty convinced that the earth is not flat now, but he's, that I don't know, <laughs> Bill and I've talked about it, you know, how can he, and he, he says he believes it's just a conspiracy that they show the round stuff. Oh, it's all, put him in a plane and take him up, <laughs> yeah, really? let him see how it <laughs> rounds off. And I think too, that we would see beautiful things that we never could imagine if we could go out as far as the moon on our trip out there. Because um, I was talking to a pilot one time and he said the most beautiful thing that he sees is when he flies from, he's based in Illinois. And when he flies up um, into Wisconsin and he gets up in the air, he can see the Northern Lights. Uh -huh. and he, he just the full northern lights and he said it's towards just, god's country just saying oh there you go <laughs> you see him all the, the time he gets to the up the closer he gets to god's country <laughs> just had to throw that in yeah <laughs> so the arctic circle must be just right yeah. outside god's gate there you go <laughs> All right, some years ago, Sultan Ibn al Saud of Saudi Arabia accompanied American astronauts on a space mission that orbited planet Earth. After returning to Earth, he wrote this. The first day or so we pointed to our countries. The third or fourth day we pointed to our continent. And by the fifth day, we were aware only of one Earth. What can all who live on planet Earth learn from his comments? Yeah. I mean, this is a perfect time to be studying something like this. It's the proverbial look at the big picture. Uh -huh. Yep. The illustration below depicts a person looking through a telescope at God's immense universe. And they're talking about this picture. And I would hold it up and read it to you, but when I hold it up, it's backwards. <laughs> so 
the last night when I was reading the book to Leah, if I, if Jenny, if I held up a book, Jenny would read it <laughs> so that Leah could see what I had pulled open. <laughs> so <clears throat> if we look through the microscope at things within the human body, we see a marvelous miniature universe. For example, if it were possible to join together all the veins and arteries within the average human body, how far would they stretch? Try to discover and then share other information about the wonders of the human body. Anybody know? Oh, we've got nurses here. Come on, you guys. <laughs> You've probably studied this in school. <laughs> I think it's several hundred miles or it'll stretch like around the earth where the equator is or something. I don't know. Yes. I'm going to Google it. Okay. Good idea. <laughs> Yay, Google. I have a really cool book. It's called the, it's called superhuman and it talks about what, how our eyes work and how we blink several hundreds of thousands of times a day. And it's just got, it just goes through how fast we could run and all kinds of really cool things. And I've been trying to get my oldest grandson interested in it. Not yet. He's not yet interested. <laughs> if, you were to, if you were to lay out all the arteries, capillaries and veins in one adult end to end they would stretch about 60,000 miles. Holy cow. <laughs> That's, a lot. Lot. That's a lot of stuff to stuff into one <laughs> frame. One human body. One human and body. I found out something. My girlfriend's husband had um, blood clots in his legs Mm -hmm. And they were traveling up and the doctors wanted to go in and put screens in so that when they got up high enough, they wouldn't go into his heart. Mm -hmm. And when they went to do that, they discovered that he has a blockage where they would put the screen, but that his body manufactured veins that went around the blockage. It is so cool. I know. So... Some people have more than 60,000 miles because <laughs> he's had all kinds of problems and they discovered all kinds of veins that had, that his body had manufactured to go around it. I hope he's so donating his body to Myra, isn't that like collateral circulation or something? Myra and I are kind of like, you know, just uterus kind of people. <laughs> we don't really, you know. Yeah, pretty, pretty specialized, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I always said all I know about the heart is I just want it to work and perfuse the placenta. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, you started to say something. I just, uh, you know, whenever anybody talks about this, the the human body itself is just so amazing um, that how can you not believe that some higher being created that we just there's just no way something like our body could come out of the muck and evolve exactly. yes or could just produce out of cells that were out of a big blast without someone orchestrating it you right. know maybe mm -hmm. we did start out of that blast as a cell but god put us together out of the mud and blue light. Put everything in the right place. Yes. <laughs> Think of that jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no wonder God gave us jigsaw puzzles so we could yes. have some idea. 3D jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are at 6.15. So do you want to go on to the next unit? Sure. I'm okay. Well, actually, let's talk a little bit about the timeline. I want to have time to do the timeline. You all have a timeline there? I actually have two of them if you want one back. Oh, was there two in your packet? 
apparently, because I have two here, <laughs> I, I had not noticed until now. All right. So if anybody complains that they're missing one, you can holler at me. Well, when I was putting the packets together last night, I, was, I finished putting the rest of them together. When some of you picked them up, I only had nine packets together. But I went in last night and put the rest of them together, and I came up with two short. So I came home because I had two timelines here at home. I actually had three. And so I just took those and put them with the extra packets. But maybe that's what happened. Maybe I put two in somebody else's packet. Uh -huh. um, so we want to talk about this part of the timeline. Uh -huh. And if you'll notice, the narrative begins in detail when God talks about the patriarch, which is here where the yellow has people in it. So the yellow part, that's where God starts talking about the details. And he starts with Abraham. Before that, he talks about other people. I mean, he talks about Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm about Cain and Abel and then the tower or then Noah this is all in Genesis and he talks about the Tower of Babel but see the blue triangle going the other way this way mm -hmm. that is how time went from we have no idea how many thousands and billions and millions of years this part of the timeline is. And we only know when we get down here to Abraham that we start understanding time. So this first block is the start of the narrative. God talking with the children of Israel, which starts out as Abraham and Sarah. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, we have no um, way of knowing how many thousands of years it was between Adam and Eve and um, Cain and Abel and then Noah. And in Genesis, Um, in the teaching graphics in number one, where God is the symbol for God here, is showing people praising him. Mm -hmm. That's Adam and Eve. So God is one, and he has beneath it are reminders that God created the universe, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the trees, birds, animals, streams, fish, people who were to know and praise God. Those are the four, that's the beginning up here. So God created all of this, and he created us to praise God. And that was, we don't know when. And then as time gets closer to Abraham, then we have these five narratives. And in the beginning, I don't know if any of you have ever questioned, um, where did Cain find a mate? Mm -hmm. God had sent him out and put a mark on him. If you go back and look at um, the beginning of Genesis 2, chapter 2, in your Bibles, I don't know how many of you have a Bible with you. <laughs> it's here somewhere. <laughs> if you go to the beginning of chapter 2 and you read it 
word for word, not just say, oh yeah, I've read this before, you'll see that it says, in the day that God caused it to rain upon the earth, God planted a garden between the Tigris and the Euphrates and the Pishon rivers before he caused it to rain on the earth, he planted this garden and he put in it every plant that was good for man, humankind. And he created a human. Adam wasn't a male until God created a female. But God created a human being. And then it goes on to explain that God brought to Adam every animal that was in the garden that he put in the garden. He brought every animal to Adam and he said, is this a mate for you? And no, none of them were found to be a good soulmate or a mate for Adam. And so God said, okay, I'll create some. So he put Adam to sleep, took the rib, created another human being and called the other human being woman. Adam means earth and God picked up the earth and created a human being. And then we hear that the Holy Spirit was there during creation and the breath of life God put the breath of life or the Holy Spirit into Adam. And we know that Jesus was there because of the first chapter of John, the Gospel of John. It says that God was, or Jesus was there before when God was creating the earth. So in the garden, that was all done on the third day. Then God created more things out on the earth and more things out on the earth. And on the sixth day, God created humankind. And it says, let us create humankind in our image, male and female, they created. So that was after God did the garden. So there were human beings out there on the earth, but not in the garden. And he told those human beings to have dominion over the earth and over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. So that's how the text reads. If you go back and look at that, between now and next week, if you don't have your Bible with you right now. I don't know, does one of you have a Bible on New Revised Standard Version, maybe? I probably do. Well, I've got one here, if you don't. I can't remember where it is. It's, it's back there. Mine's right here, so I can read it to you if you want. I was going to have somebody else read it or speak for a minute. Okay. So in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, this is Genesis 1, 1. The earth was formless, void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome, and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. 
And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation. So the earth is putting forth the vegetation plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on the earth that bear fruit with seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit and the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God mm -hmm. said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. So that was the third day. And the, this is the fourth day. Um, he put the domes in the, separated the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let the lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. He set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring form swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good and he blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so, God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind, the Hebrew word is Adama, in his image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, God created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So now we're at chapter two. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it because on it, God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Now it says, in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens, 
when no plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth and there was no one to till the ground, but a stream would rise from the earth and water the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, this is on the third day, and there he put the man whom he had formed, out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A river flows out of Eden to water the garden and from there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is Kishon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold and the gold of that land is good Bedelium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flows around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to the field, every animal of the field. But for the human man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed it up in its place. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. When, then the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman. For out of man, this one was taken. And then it goes on, therefore a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife and they become one flesh and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So, there they are. <laughs> a lot of theologians argue that there's two creation accounts. And, and I realize that. But in my reading it, and I think God wants us to read it and, you know, and to understand and to, and know what it says. If you talk about it in the way that it reads, if the garden was made on the third day, then it explains where Cain found his wife because humankind was made on the sixth day. It explains how God made male and female when he made humankind, and he didn't when he made Adam. He just made a human and then decided to make a woman. Um, it also gives us the opportunity to say there could have been thousands of years between the days. Yes, they were probably 24-hour days that God did all this in. 
But then the earth brought forth the tree from seed. And the earth brought forth the plant from seed. Um, it's possible that then, however many thousand years went by, God did this a second time on the second day for 24 hours. Evening and morning were the second day, and God saw that everything was good. It's just a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's, that it's right. I'm just saying if you can look at it from a different perspective, like we, when we get away from the earth, we look back and see one big globe. We don't, and, or the UP. <laughs> so I think, I don't know, what do you think? It's hard to wrap your head around, mm -hmm. bit, really. But I mean, who's to say anybody's perspective is, you know, right or wrong? I mean, because we don't know the time frame. So it seems plausible. Little time for evolution to happen in there, you know, for the evolutionists, you know, if it's a thousand years between days, you know, it can make it all make a little more sense. Yeah, I don't think we have to, um, you know, say that this took place within six days, like we refer to now as six days. Um, you know, even I, I have no issues with believing that it could be thousands of years, maybe millions of years between days. Um, you know, I just don't think we'll ever know. In this, in this life, anyway. I don't think it's important to know the time periods. No, I don't either. I think it's the, the, the major fact is that there was someone who did it who created all of these things and who made them work together and, you know, took care of the earth and all the beings on it um, and continues to do that. I'm still, I'm still stuck down here on this number four on the, on the little timeline thing. It says, it's Genesis 6, and I, my Bible is upstairs, so I'm not going to look for it, but it says it describes divine beings being sexually intimate with earthly women, and cosmic chance results. We might want to wait till next week to talk about this one. <laughs> I might I'll read it to you so that you know what week. it's, pardon? I might have to think about that for more than one week. <laughs> It says here, chapter six, and they've just gone through a whole huge genealogy yeah. of hundreds yeah. of years and how many hundreds of years Ooh, people well, lived. All and, the big ads. Right. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. And so all the days of Enoch were 165 years. And then with God and he was no more because God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech at 187 years. Wow. <laughs> Methuselah lived after the birth of Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Ouch. Um, okay. that's, that's chapter five. Okay, so now we're going, and now we've gotten to Noah. Lamech right. had Noah. After okay. Noah was 500 years old, Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. When people began, this is the beginning of chapter six, verse one. Right. When people right. began to multiply on the face of the ground and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair. 
and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh, and their days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans, who bore children to them. These were the heroes of old, warriors of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. And these are the descendants of Noah. And then it goes on and talks about Shem, Ham, and Japheth and how the earth was corrupt and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw that the earth was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And now I'm going to destroy them along with the earth Make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in the ark, and so on. We know that story. Okay. okay. That's what that's it means. Right. It's, it's that's what it, what it says when it says... Creations. A creation after... No, when they talk about two creations, they talk about the creation in chapter 6, or in chapter 1 of Genesis, verse right. the sixth day. And uh -huh. then they say that the garden and Noah and Eve were separate. That yeah, God, then God yeah. also created the garden and Adam and Eve. And these are people, usually these are people who adhere to God right. did this in seven days consecutively. Right. Seven 24-hour days and on the seventh day, he rested. And then he created the Garden of Eden. But if you read it, it gives you something to think about. <laughs> Clearly. Okay. So I think that's enough for this. <laughs> Shall we do a closing prayer? Does anybody have anything that they specifically want to pray about? The wildfires in California. Oh. Yeah. Especially, well, not just in California, out west. Oregon, yeah. Oregon, Oregon and Washington, too. All right. There's even a fire, a wildfire in Alaska. Every western state is impacted by this because i was looking at the map every western state it's really overwhelming and the wind blows from the west <laughs> i mean it's keep your house wet <laughs> all right let's bow our heads lord we thank you for your word we thank you for giving us this to help us to know how much you love us, to help us to understand a little bit more about your miraculous power, your loving kindness, your forgiveness, that you didn't destroy all of us, that you went on, um, that your perspective is the best perspective for us to have as we think of each other, as we think of those people all around our globe who are just like us. Help us to know that, Lord. Help us to mourn for the people who have lost things in the fires out west. Please contain those. Please um, help us to know how we can best help. 
besides praying. Help us to know that you are with each person who's affected by all of the different disasters going on now, with all the different hurricanes and fires and the pandemic. Also, Lord, for our disagreements or our differences of opinion, help us to stop and try to see from the other person's perspective that we might not fight and argue over this, but to lovingly care for one another. As we go through this week, help us to think more about your word. Um, be with us, keep each person here safe, and all those who hopefully will be joining us in the future. We'll be with our families and loved ones and live with all those who are um, fighting this pandemic and need healing for whatever reason. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.